good morning hello students uh, this is dr hemlata associate professor in zoology maharani science college for women palace road bangalore so we shall be learning some aspects about ethology what is ethology the term ethology is derived from two greek words ethos which means culture and logos which means study so ethology is the study of the animal behavior it is the scientific biological and specific study of animal behavior when you say animal behavior behavior means you have to you should be able to identify some kind of a change in an animal to a stimulus a stimulus can be either physical like it can be the light it can be sound or it can be a chemical factor like a pheromone so when an animal is exposed to any kind of a stimulus like the light or the sound or the chemical what it does is it will show some response to the stimuli this response is called as the behavior sometimes an animal will do some activity for which a second animal will show some response now the first animal which is bringing about a response in the second one is releasing a behavior pattern in the second one this is called as release of the behavior pattern so when you say behavior it means you should be able to see the changes what is exhibited by the animal those changes should be recognizable like it has to make a sound or it should be able to express whatever it is feeling by communication like what you see in higher forms like human beings or it should move in response to the stimuli either a part of the body will move or the entire body will move or they can exhibit some expressions on the face they can walk away or they can talk they can show a change in the body posture or simply they can stand still without showing any response it's called as freeze reaction there can be color change or release of a chemical substance so whatever the animal is doing why is it doing it is doing for its own benefit like it has to survive so the stimuli can be either beneficial or harmful if it is beneficial for example let us say it has found the source of food then it has to go and fetch the food or if it has found a mate then they have to um, mate and reproduce or if they have produced young ones they have to take care of the young one they should protect the young one from the predator if they come across a predator they should run away from the predator so these are all the responses what the animal will be showing for the benefit of itself in this picture you can see a group of monkeys they are attracted by some kind of stimuli and each one is showing a type of response so what you are seeing here is the response of the monkeys to the stimulus so what is behavior when an animal is exposed to a stimulus it is showing a response so behavior results in so many other aspects for example when an animal is exposed to a new stimuli then 
it will show a different type of response. A classical example for this is the moth Biston betularia, which was seen in United Kingdom. This moth was a light colored moth which would settle on the bark of the trees and it would merge with the background color and was not identifiable by the predator. Because of industrialization, carbon soot deposited on the uh, bark of the trees and the light colored moth was easily identifiable by the predator and it was picked up by the predator. So what the moth did was it started developing some dark colored pigments and became darker in color so that it was not identifiable when it settled on the black colored background. It merged with the background. By doing this it showed an adaptation because of which it, it could survive. So it resulted, this adaptation resulted in the variation. What the variation here you see is the light colored moth became dark colored and these variations was passed on to the next generation and hence it became inheritable. So with such adaptations which can be carried to other generations, the species will become best equipped and they have greater chances of survival and hence the perpetuation of the race will take, continue. So the adaptations and inheritance results in differential reproduction and hence the survival of the race. A lot of people have contributed to the study of behavioral biology. Some of the pioneers who started their work in the field is uh, to name a few Julian Huxley who worked with birds was an ornithologist, Conrad Lawrence and Nicholas Tinbergen again ornithologists, Carl von Frisch entomologist, William Morton Wheeler also an entomologist. They conducted lot of experiments with birds and insects and understand the behavioral aspects. So now, if you see what could be the cause of the behavior, there are two causes. Let us say an animal is hungry. So what it will do? It will try to find food and eat. So the, this is the cause which is for the immediate need and it is called as the proximate cause. For the purpose of survival, it has to eat. That is the proximate cause. But what is the ultimate cause? It has to eat, grow, mature and reproduce. And by doing that, the it has to perpetuate the race. That is the ultimate cause. So the behavior, whatever the animal is doing for the immediate causes for the survival and the ultimate causes to perpetuate the race. So with this introduction, we will see why is it important to study ethology. Basically, people were interested and they were really fascinated looking at the life in the wild. They used to wonder, looking at the behavioral aspects of the wild animals, they became inquisitive and they tried to find out what could be the reasons uh, scientifically. For example, if you look at the birds, Birds show migration wherein the birds travel from one part of the world and they fly thousands of kilometers covering more than 18,000 kilometers reaching a different part of the world. So people were really fascinated from where are they coming and where are they going. So they really wanted to understand uh, what could be the reason. So they wanted to know the reason uh, and hence they started studying about the behavioral aspects of the animals. Farmers definitely need to have uh, information because they rear a lot of animals and they do domesticate the animals. 
definitely knowing the behavior of these will be helpful for them like uh, when they are rearing silkworms or honey bee or fishes knowing the behavior will definitely help them a lot a hunter a uh, layman cannot go out hunting it is very important for the hunter to have an to have some kind of experience or some information about the behavior so that he can explore the forest and go for hunting it's also important to control the uh, pests like the insects or rodents and national park and zoo workers they need to understand the behavioral aspects to maintain the animals and also if you have pets the behavior the behave if you know the behavior of your pets it becomes easier to handle them the study of behavior is lot of time consuming and requires a lot of patience so if you look at the wildlife videos those videos when they have been shot it's not a easy uh, job they need a lot of time because behavioral aspect is not a display when you can go and shoot whatever you want you have to sit there and wait when the animals uh, do such kind of uh, display you should be able to shoot it so what you see easily within few minutes would have taken hours or days or even months for a behavior biologist to capture it so if you look at the types of animal behavior there are two main types of animal behavior the first is the innate or inherent behavior second is learned or acquired behavior under the innate or inherent behavior which is also called a stereotype behavior we will be learning kinesis taxis reflexes instincts and motivation under acquired or learned behavior we'll be learning imprinting habituation trial and error learning so first of all we'll start with the stereotype behavior what is stereotype behavior the behavior which helps the animal to its to attend to its basic needs like to find the food or to escape from the enemies or to reproduce such behavior is called as the stereotype behavior you can see a highly coordinated organized responses of the animal or very unorganized poor responses of the animals this depends upon the complexity of the nervous system the invertebrates like sponges exhibit poor or unorganized responses whereas a vertebrate which has got a well developed brain shows highly coordinated response to the stimulus so we will be doing all the different types of uh, uh, behavior under stereotype we'll see one by one stereotype behavior so when an animal is exposed to a stimuli it shows a response so for one type of response the stimuli is always the same so for one response how many ever times the animal is exposed to that the response the, the how many ever times the animal is exposed to a stimuli the response will be the same this is called as repeated pattern of behavior so the behavior is bound to the stimulus the stimulus generally is from the environment the stimulus will trigger response and the response will be in a sequence at the response what it is showing is inherent means all the animals belonging to one species will exhibit the same kind of response to the stimuli so it is passed on from one generation to another it is species specific it can show adaptation it is unlearned it will not forget the behavior and it's it shows fixed action pattern what do you mean by fixed action pattern we will take an example of a growling behavior in gray lag goose in this slide you can see the gray lag goose in the picture there are four sequences in the first one the gray lag goose has laid eggs in the nest and accidentally if the egg rolls out of the nest then what the gray lag goose does is 
it walks towards the egg it puts its beak in front of the egg and it brings the egg below its neck the egg is now between the beak and the neck and it starts rolling the egg until it comes back to the nest this is the behavior pattern sequence of behavior pattern what the gray lag goose shows when the eggs rolls out so this pattern is a fixed action whenever the egg rolls out of the nest the bird will roll it back to the nest this kind of pattern is called as fixed action pattern and this response is triggered by a stimulus the stimulus is rolling out of the egg the egg is rolled out of the nest that is the stimulus called as the sign stimulus and the response is the fixed action pattern exhibited by gray lag goose in rolling the egg back to the nest so it was jacques loeb who coined the term tropism so he defined that tropism is the response of the animal to the stimulus by showing movements so this type of movement which the animal shows to the response is called as spatial orientation under spatial orientation there are two types one is called as kinesis second one is called as taxis in kinesis when the animal is exposed to a stimulus it starts moving but the movement is random it may accidentally go towards the stimuli or away from the stimuli so it is an unoriented random movement such a type of unoriented random movement is called as kinesis the second one is taxis in this when the animal animal is exposed to a stimulus it will either go towards the stimuli if it is beneficial or it goes away from the stimuli if it is harmful so this type of oriented movement either towards or away from the stimuli is called as taxis if it is going towards you call it as positive taxis if it is going away you call it as negative taxis so in this picture you are show you are seeing the response of a planaria which is a uh, flat worm example for platyhelminthes so whenever it is exposed to a food source it moves towards the food source it is a positive movement and in the second one you can see euglena so whenever euglena comes across light it starts moving towards the light because it is having chlorophyll it can synthesize its own food it needs light and it goes towards the light so it shows positive taxis because it's moving towards the light it is called as positive photo taxis there are different types of taxis de depending upon the source of the stimuli if the stimuli is light you call it as phototaxis you call it as geotaxis when the stimuli is center of gravity specific gravity of the earth hydrotaxis that is the source is towards water either towards or away from the water chemotaxis stimuli is chemical aerotaxis the stimuli is oxygen rich environment barotaxis when it when the stimuli is related to pressure galveno or electrotaxis for electric current magnetotaxis for magnetic field anemotaxis for wind rheotaxis for water current so under the types of taxis you have different uh, subtypes we will see what are the subtypes which are seen in different forms of animals so you are seeing some in the invertebrate species where the central nervous system is not well developed and the receptors are not as well developed as you see in vertebrates 
the receptors can be symmetrical or asymmetrical it can be very simple like a shaded eye spot in such cases how the animal behaves to the response you have different subtypes the first one is clinotaxis in this case the photoreceptors are asymmetrical when the photoreceptors are asymmetrical the animal receives different stimuli on different parts of the body so what it has to do it has to move this way that way it has to compare the light intensity and then it has to make a decision where it has to go this type of movement is called as clinotaxis as shown in euglena or uh, earthworm second one is trophotaxis here there are paired receptors and these receptors will compare the here the stimuli is the light they will compare the light intensity coming from two different sources they will move this way they will move that way they will compare the intensity and they will take a in between path an intermediate path this is called as tropotaxis as seen in planaria which will try to move away from the light showing negative phototaxis then you have telotaxis where the orientation is direct there is no intermediate the animal will go to one source or to another source so when it does that it can go in a zigzag way so example hermit crab when the two stimuli when there are two stimuli the animal will move from one to another and then it will decide where it has to go and it will go to that stimuli so this is called as telotaxis if the response is based on the landmark then you call it as phanotaxis for example if you look at bird migration when they are migrating some people believe that they will follow the landmarks so if they are following the landmark and they are moving towards a stimuli it is called as phanotaxis it is menotaxis when the animal is moving at an angle it's not going straight it's going in an angle then it is menotaxis for example homing uh, the ants and the bees then next is nemotaxis again here it follows the familiar landscapes and the next one is thermotaxis here temperature will act as the stimuli some forms like nematodes they will migrate and they will sense very small difference of temperature like 0.1 degree centi centigrade per centimeter they are so sensitive for the variation in the temperature and they follow that so this is called as thermotaxis thigmotaxis where the animal will respond to the touch or the physical contact whenever a rat swims it prefers to swim near the edge of a water maze so it keeps touching the maze and that will guide it to guide the rats to swim this is called as thigmotaxis so now we will see the different types of taxis movements phototaxis where the animal is responding to the stimulus light if it is moving towards light it is positive phototaxis example euglena if it is moving away from the light it is negative phototaxis example cockroach here you can see a picture where the light is attracting the moth an example for positive phototaxic or phototaxis here the earthworm doesn't prefer light it try to moves away from the light an example for negative phototaxis so earthworm is referred as negatively phototaxic if the stimulus is chemical you call it as chemotaxis the response is elicited by the gradation in the chemicals so a lot of studies has been uh, carried out in Uh, unicellular and uh, bacterial cultures where they could see that the bacteria e coli uh, 
prefers to move towards the sugar in the culture medium so if it is attracted to towards a chemical you call it as a chemo attractant if the chemical is trying to chase away the animal those chemicals are referred to as chemo repellents so basically chemotaxis is seen in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells when the chemicals is released on the uh, land so it can be carried by the wind then you call it as anemotaxis for example the dog pheromone is released on the land so whenever the dog urinates along with the urine it passes out the pheromones which gives some information about the status of the dog telling whether it's a male or a female dog whether it is reproductively mature or not so here the chemicals are released on the land if you look at a uh, silk moth the female silk moth will release the pheromone bombicool into the air and this bombicool has got the capacity to attract the male moth which is quite far away so here the chemical is released into the air chemicals in water if you look at paramecium when the paramecium is there in the water medium if there are some toxic chemicals they tend to move away from the chemical you call it as phobo taxis what is the significance of chemotaxis the chemotaxis where the animal tries to follow the chemicals or either they move towards or away from the chemicals it will help them to locate the food source it will help them to avoid toxic substances if you look at higher forms it will help in the movement of the sperm in the female reproductive body so that they will be able to reach the egg and fertilize again in higher forms whenever the tissue transformation is happening development of nervous system is happening so the chemotaxis will help in the transformation process when the central nervous system is developing it plays a major role in immune reactions and also in the proliferation and growth of the tumors and if the, especially in the cancerous cells when they become metastatic spreading to different parts of the body the chemotaxis plays a role here you can see some pictures how the butterfly is attracted by the scent produced by the flowers the ants which are following the trails if you see a ant colony you can see the ants are moving in one straight line that is because of the chemical pheromone which is released and it will help them in finding the food source a mosquito biting if you observe in a family the mosquito preferably will bite some people because of the chemical nature of their um, whatever secreted if they have more amount of carbon dioxide or if they have more lactic acid then they will sense that and they try to prefer to bite such people and uh, you can also see the skunk which produces a odor which is uh, very repellent it is called as a defensive odor which will try to keep away the predator so these are some ex examples for uh, the chemo uh, taxis next is geotaxis or gravitaxis here the stimuli is the specific gravity the earth specific gravity will act as the stimuli some animals prefer to move towards the earth that is towards the gravity they are attracted towards the earth they start moving down towards the ground it is called as positive uh, geotaxis if it moves away if it tries to go away from the ground if they climb up the Uh, stem of the plant or the tree then it is negative geotaxis so there are some examples for that the planktonic larvae of a king crab the scientific name lithodes equispinus shows for positive uh, phototaxis but negative gravitaxis they go towards light but they 
go away from the ground they start moving upwards the larvae of a polychaete platinearis dumerili shows positive phototaxis moving towards light and they also show positive gravitaxis they start moving down towards the earth both positive and negative gravitaxis are found in protozoans like Lo loxodus then remanella and paramecium next if the stimuli is a sound then you call it as phonotaxis movement of an organism in response to a sound source is called as phonotaxis if you look at the animal uh, during breeding season the male will generally make sounds to attract the female you call this as courtship songs so the male will sing the courtship song to attract the female which is an example for phonotaxis the moth the moth has got ears on the thoracic region if you look at your the e eco location in bats bats have got the capacity to produce ultrasonic waves with the help of these ultrasonic waves they will try to catch the prey moth is a prey for the bat and when the bat produces the ultrasonic waves it will go hit the prey and it will come back when it comes back the bat will try to identify the eco and try to catch the prey whereas the moth also has got some adaptations it has got ears on the thoracic region so that it will be able to hear the ultrasonic cry of the bats and try to move away from the bat and escape from the bat so this picture is showing how the ultrasonic waves created by the bat is going reaching the moth and it will come back in the form of eco so to avoid that the moth which has got ears in the thoracic region will try to move away from the bat other examples if you look at the animal kingdom the bats and the dolphins can detect ultrasound bees can see ultraviolet light which we cannot see moths have got very acute sense of smell where they can even detect even if a molecule of female pheromone is released snakes can detect infrared light and fishes can sense electromagnetic waves so with this we had a, uh, we just went through the slides where we could study some of the examples of the first type of spatial orientation that is taxis next we will start with kinesis unlike taxis kinesis is not a oriented movement when an animal is exposed to a stimulus it starts moving randomly without orientation without a particular direction and the rate of the movement depends upon the intensity of the stimuli if the stimuli is mild the movement is less if the stimuli is strong the movement is more Um, vigorous so one example what you can see is when you switch on the light the cockroach will start moving in all the directions because it's basically uh, doesn't like light it is uh, negatively phototaxic so as soon as it sees the light source it starts moving in all the directions and try to escape from the light under kinesis there are two types first is orthokinesis when an animal is exposed to a stimuli it starts moving fast the rate of the movement is proportional to the intensity of the stimuli if the stimuli is mild the movement is slow if the stimuli is strong the movement is fast 
so the rate of the movement of the animal is directly proportional to the strength of the stimuli so this is called as orthokinesis for example wood lice it prefers humidity if humidity reduces it starts showing random movement and it shows movement until it reaches a suitable place the second type of kinesis is called as clinokinesis here the rate of change of direction is directly proportional to the intensity of the stimulus in the first one it was the rate of movement that is either it moved fast or slow here it is the rate of change of direction when the animal is exposed to a stimulus it starts changing the direction of its movement which is again proportional to the intensity of the stimulus if the stimulus is mild it changes its direction slowly if the stimuli is strong it changes its direction fast for example if you look at paramecium in the culture if the carbon dioxide concentration is high paramecium starts moving fast and starts moving until it reaches a safe place so here you can see some examples of random movement so in the first one you are seeing the insects which are trying to avoid the stimuli by showing random movement and also a rat when it comes out rats are nocturnal animals when it comes out in a light area it doesn't know what it has to do it simply moves randomly until it reaches a safe place so with this we completed taxis and kinesis the next is a reflex action what do you mean by a reflex action a reflex is an automatic involuntary response to a stimulus which is from outside or to an internal feedback so to maintain homeostasis inside the body the organism will exhibit this type of action called as reflex action what is the benefit of exhibiting reflex action one example what you can give for reflex action is suppose you touch something very hot immediately you are withdrawing your hand from the hot surface or if you step upon a sharp object you will withdraw your leg from the sharp object so basically this is called as the reflex action and by performing this reflex action you are removing your body from the painful stimuli or you are trying to prevent you from falling down or injuring yourself so this type of removing the body from a painful stimuli is an example for reflex action if you look at internally also body in order to maintain homeostatic conditions it shows some sort of behavior so for example when you are uh, in a very uh, stuffy place where there is not enough oxygen it's not a well aerated room it's not a well ventilated room the body starts starts yawning by doing so you are take trying to take more oxygen so yawning is a reflex action so like that to maintain the oxygen level to maintain the blood pressure to maintain the breath rate the body shows some sort of mechanisms to adapt which are the reflex actions to maintain the internal homeostasis constant suppose you happen to swallow something and that's an irritant it is toxic so what the body does it will try to remove the toxic substance by vomiting so by doing forcible um you're bringing the food the toxic substance out of your body forcibly by vomiting one another example for reflex action i mean which is not under your control is the change in the size of the pupil of your eye suppose you are in a very uh, bright uh, sunny day you are outside and you enter a room 
where there is no light it is dark then immediately you go blind you cannot see anything that is because when you are outside because of the bright light your pupil size would have reduced to cut down the uh, source of light entering into your eyes when you enter the dark room the amount of light entering the pupil is not sufficient for you to look at what is there inside it will take some time during which your pupil will relax so that more amount of light will enter and you will be able to see the light coughing sneezing are other examples for reflexes hello students welcome back to the part 2 of stereotyped behavior in the part 1 i had just given introduction about reflexes reflex is an automatic involuntary response when you are exposed to a stimulus the stimulus can either be from outside or from inside if the stimulus is from outside you will try to avoid the stimuli if it is harmful for example if you touch a hot surface you withdraw your hand if the stimuli is from inside for example the carbon dioxide build up is more in the blood then you yawn more to take in more oxygen and that's a response for maintaining internal homeostasis vomiting coughing sneezing are activities for maintaining internal homeostasis which i had spoken in the first part now we shall continue with the second part in reflexes there are two types tonic reflex and phasic reflex tonic reflex will take place in a given pace of time it is slow and it takes time like the development of postures in the baby phasic reflex is a fast action it is called as flexion response now when you are exposed to the stimuli you show the response the time between the stimuli ex- exposure to the stimuli to showing the response is called as the latent period if the stimuli is strong the latent period is less if the stimuli is weak then the latent period is more so i told you tonic reflex is a one is the one which takes its own time for development for example the different types of postures which is exhibited by a developing baby if you look at the growth of the baby first it will grasp your finger then it will turn to its side then slowly it falls on the abdomen then it raises its it crawls it raises its body with four limbs then it will sit up it will stand and start walking these change in the postures during the developmental stage gives an example for tonic reflex when we say uh, reflex reflex action it involves reflex arc so for this type of response there is a structure which is responsible for showing such quick reaction which is called as the reflex arc it is a very simple pathway found in the nervous system it is a pathway in which the stimuli information from the stimuli is taken to the nervous system and then it goes either to the brain or to the spinal cord which in turn will give messages to the target organ so if you look at the components of reflex arc first of all there are five components first one is the sensory receptor is the sensory receptor is the one which will receive the stimulus from the sensory receptor sensory neuron will pass the stimuli to the central nervous system 
then the integration can happen either in the brain or in the spinal cord from the brain or the spinal cord motor neurons will carry the message to the effector organ generally the effector organ will be a muscle which shows coordinated contraction and relaxation bringing about movement or it could be a gland which results in secretion of some uh, it could be a hormone or a enzyme depending upon the stimuli so there are five components sensory receptor to receive the stimuli sensory neuron to carry the stimuli to the central nervous system brain or spinal cord where integration will happen motor neuron will carry the messages to the effector organ the effector organ is muscle or gland now reflexes can be categorized into two main groups one is the somatic reflex the other one is the autonomic or visceral reflex we will see what do you mean by autonomic reflex depending upon the effector tissue we classify the reflexes into autonomic or somatic if the effector tissue is not under your control it is involuntary it it is a uh, part of autonomic responses in the nervous system you call it as autonomic reflex some of the tissues which come under autonomic control is the smooth muscle like what you find in your digestive tract the cardiac muscle of the heart and the glandular tissue so here both the brain and the spinal cord can act as integrating centers they can take in the stimuli and give the response either brain can do that or spinal cord can do that some examples for autonomic reflexes are when you look at food or when you think about food if you smell food then you will start either uh, producing saliva in the mouth or start secreting gastric juice all these are examples for autonomic reflexes like that regulating the blood pressure regulating the heart rate regulating the breath rate are all examples of autonomic reflexes the second type of reflex based on the type of the effector is called as somatic reflex here the effector tissue is skeletal muscle skeletal muscle is under your control you can decide what you have to do whether you have to sit or stand or move so it is under your conscious control you can control the activity of the skeletal muscle this type of reflex is called as somatic reflex which is under your conscious control so for example you can control your breath rate when you do pranayama you can increase the inhalation and exhalation rate that is your conscious control of breathing or when you are swallowing you can control that you can blink your eyes if you need and when you touch something you can pull away your hand or you can walk away from a sharp object all these will come under uh, somatic reflexes wherein the skeletal muscle is performing the activity voluntarily there are three common somatic reflexes so one is the uh, stretch reflex which is shown in knee jerk when you sit on a chair and there is an experiment in which when somebody hits on the knee the knee will reflex it produces a jerk this is called a stretch reflex shown in the patella region of the knee withdrawal reflex when you touch something hot you pull away your hand that is called as withdrawal reflex or it could be crossed extensor reflex wherein you will stretch out your muscle to do something extensor means you are extending your muscle to do some sort of activity so these are all exam uh, the types of somatic reflexes now based on where the receptor is located you have different types of receptors which will receive 
the stimulus and bring about reflex action. If the receptor is located on the outer surface, you call it as exteroreceptor reflex. If the receptors are inside the body and brings about reflex action, you call it as enteroreceptor reflex. If the receptors are located on the skeletal muscle, you call it as proprioreceptor reflex. And if the when the stimuli is taken to the central nervous system, not only the brain, even at the level of the spinal cord, the information can be integrated because some actions need immediate response. So for which the stimuli need not have to travel all the way to the brain. At the spinal level itself, integration can happen. Then you call it as spinal reflex. So if it is on the stimuli is received on the lower part of the body, it brings about spinal reflex. If the stimuli is received on the upper part of the body, it brings about cranial reflex. Apart from this, you have something called as conditional and unconditional reflex. Conditional reflex is, you don't know how to swim, but when you learn to swim, you never forget. Similarly, cycling, driving, all that, you are learning it and conditioning your body to do that activity. So there is also the dog's experiment called Pavlov's experiment, where the scientist rang the bell and gave the food. So after a few days, when the bell was rang, the dogs will start salivating. So this is conditioning the dog to salivate. These are examples for conditional reflex. One example for unconditional reflex is contraction of the pupil, which I have already spoken about in the part 1 uh, video, wherein if you go out in a bright light, your pupil will contract to limit the amount of light entering your eyes and when you come inside a room where the light is not enough you will go blind then slowly the pupil will relax allowing more amount of light and then you will be able to see in the dark room this you don't have to do anything it happens on its own so it is unconditional reflex so with this we completed uh, reflex uh, behavior behavior the next one what we have to do under stereotype behavior is motivation or drive. What do you mean by motivation or drive? Now we know that when an animal is exposed to a stimulus it shows response. But sometimes what response is which it shows is not same. It is different at different times and that depends upon the state of the animal. We can take an example of African lion. This African lion when it is hungry it tries to find the prey. It goes in search of the prey, it hunts and kills and it will eat. Once the African lion hunts and eats and it is satiated, it is full. The condition is satiated condition then it will sit down and relax. At that time, if a prey comes close to that, it doesn't do anything. It simply ignores the prey and it just casually is sitting there. This state is called a satiated state. Now, for the lion to show hunting behavior, what is the cause? It should be hungry. If it is hungry, it shows hunting behavior. If it is not hungry, it simply ignores the prey. So there has to be a force or a drive to show the behavior of motivation. So if you look at the sequence of the motivation, you will see that an animal will exhibit the goal oriented behavior. So what is the goal here? When the animal is hungry, that is the drive. When the animal is hungry with the drive, the animal, the lion goes in search of the prey, that is the stimulus. So searching the prey is the goal searching phase. Once it finds a prey, it hunts, kills and it will consume. That is the consumation act phase. After that, it simply sits and relaxes. It is called a quiescent period. 
during which even if a prey comes close to the predator, it does not cause any harm to the predator. This type of action is called as fixed action pattern which we have already studied in the first part where we gave an example of a grueling behavior in grey lag goose. So, this sequence of action which happens in a pattern is called as fixed action pattern. So, scientists have tried to explain the neurophysiological aspect of motivation behavior. If you look at your own physiology, the amount of urine produced is not the same throughout the year. During summer, you excrete, the excretion of, the amount of urine excreted is less compared to that which is excreted during winter. That is because in summer, we have to regulate our body temperature, we have to maintain it constant. So, the excess of heat is dissipated in the form of sweat. So, here what plays a role to control the volume of urine production in your body? It is the hormone uh, which is secreted from the brain on the ventral surface of the cerebrum. There is below the diencephalon there is hypothalamus where you have adenohypophysis and neurohypophysis. Neurohypophysis secretes antidiuretic hormone which is responsible for absorption of water. You have studied all this in your PU class. So, this antidiuretic hormone is responsible for absorption of water. So, the absorption of water will be more in summer and it will be less in winter. As a result, more amount of water is excreted in the form of urine. So, this is how neurophysiologically the urine secretion happens, uh, control of the urine production happens in human beings. So, there are many examples which are controlled this way like your sleep behavior, the sexual behavior, emotional behavior, maternal behavior are all examples and this is controlled uh, by neurophysiological pathway as explained in the case of antidiuretic hormone. So, hypothalamus has got two regulatory mechanisms. One is it will excite, another one is it is inhibited, inhibit. Whenever there is a need, then excitation will happen. When there is no need, then inhibition will happen. So, when there is a need, there is a drive, you call it as excitatory uh, pathway. When there is no need, when the animal is satiated, it does not show the behavior, you call it as inhibitory pathway. So, this is how the motivation is controlled by the brain and in turn both the nervous system and the endocrine system together will control the behavior of the animal. So, with this we completed the motivation behavior. Now, we shall look into what do you mean by innate behavior or instinct behavior. The behavior which comes by birth, it is inborn, it is not learned, it does not go anywhere to learn. This type of innate behavior is called as instinct behavior. One which is coming by birth is instinct behavior. So, this behavior is complete, there is no need for any kind of experience or there is no need to learn this behavior. It is a fixed type of behavior, it does not change and it is inherited from one generation to another. What examples can you do, can you give for instinct behavior? If you look at animals in the wild, they display lot of behavioral patterns to attract the mate, which is called as courtship behavior. For example, the bird singing songs. Generally, in birds, the male will display uh, courtship behavior to attract the female. This is an example for innate behavior. In the wild, the animals will mark their territory. There will be different ranges, core range, home range, wherein the animal will select a place which is rich in resources, where it can find food, 
where it can give birth to the young ones it can protect it young ones and it has to mark its territory with pheromones this marking the territory is the territorial behavior which is again an example for instinct behavior and also if you look at in wild there is a hierarchical system the one who is dominant will be the superior one who doesn't listen to anybody and all others will have to follow this one this superior one is called as the dominant one or the alpha if it is a male you call it as a alpha male if it is a female you call it as a alpha female and all others will listen to that this is called as hierarchical system again an instinct behavior migration where you look at the birds which migrate from one part of the world to the other which is again an instinct behavior people used to think that the migration is because of the experience which they have got earlier but when they studied they saw that during migration they migrate from one place to another for the purpose of reproduction so after reproducing if it is so if the experience is playing a part then the adult should go first followed by the young ones but when they studied they saw that the young ones are reaching first and then the adults follow so experience is not playing a role over here and it is an example for instinct behavior the migration happens just by uh, birth without any effort it happens automatically so like that east evasion hibernation which the animals will exhibit to avoid extremes of climatic conditions the circadian rhythm what we will be doing in the next chapter the aggressive behavior which the animal shows are all examples of innate behavior here you are seeing some examples in the first picture the baby is pulling its leg putting its toe and sucking the uh, toe or if you go close to the baby if something touches the cheek the baby turns towards that that is a uh, sucking behavior which the baby exhibits so that it can get milk so this is an instinct behavior what the baby has obtained by birth then the male frog once it matures it starts producing sound to attract the mate again an instinct behavior the turtles when they hatch out they swim towards the sea as soon as they hatch which is again an example for instinct behavior so other examples what we have learnt the grey lag goose a growling behavior similarly when the mother bird feeds the young one the mother bird on the beak will have a color patch so the young one will go and peck on the colored patch present on the beak once the baby bird pecks then the baby bird opens the mouth and the mother bird feeds the young one so this is called as food begging behavior which is found in the gull the bird gull so what the baby bird does it pecks on the beak of the mother which has a colored patch it pecks on that for which the mother the after pecking the baby bird opens the mouth and the mother feeds the another classical example for instinct behavior is nest building behavior if you look at the variety of nests made by the birds it is so fantastic they never go anywhere to learn that behavior if you look at the tailor bird tailor bird will select broad leaves it brings the leaves together and it pierces the edge of the leaf with the beak and it sews the edge of the leaf with silk like material by doing that it is stitching the sides of the leaf and making a pouch in which soft material is stuffed and eggs are laid similarly you have the weaver bird where the bird will take some strings and weave the nest you must have seen this nest present on the water bodies it will hang down vertically on up uh, on the top side of the nest there is a, a small uh, uh, part with which it is hung on the branches of the tree then there is a broader part and then again there is a narrow part in this narrow part there is an entrance 
So when the birds enter, they make a platform and one small entry space is also left. The birds enter inside, they rest on the horizontal platform and there the eggs are laid and um, young ones will be taken care of. So the nest building behavior is very fascinating what you see in the wild. Similarly, if you look at the way the uh, spider will spin the web, you must have seen the cobweb. Some of them are quite big. If you go to the wild uh, forest, there you will see between two trees which are quite apart, the spider will spin the cobweb. It takes only about half an hour for the spider to make such a big cobweb. It has got silk gland and it has got three pairs of spinnerets. So through the spinnerets, it secretes a liquid which is a scleroprotein and this liquid when exposed to air, it hardens. So when it starts making the cobweb, first the, cob, uh, the spider will make a Y alphabet like structure. So this is called as the Y scaffold. It forms a frame and to this Y it goes on spinning the silk like circular, uh, uh, circularly it goes on making the cobweb. Then it makes spirals, the vertical bars to support the cobweb. So if you look at the way the spider spins so perfectly it does without any learning or without any effort. Here you can see the picture of the tailor bird where you can see the tiny bird is stitching the edges of the leaf making the pouch in which the eggs are laid and the young ones hatch out. In this picture you can see how the cobweb is made. There is a initially Y scaffold then the circular uh, threads are formed then it is supported by the radial spokes. So these are examples for instinct behavior which comes by birth. And you can see here how beautifully the uh, honey bee will make the honeycomb perfect to scale hexagonal cells end to end it is joined no mistake anywhere so perfectly it makes the honey cell without any effort. So with this we completed the first part of the stereotyped behavior uh, wherein we did uh, kinesis, taxis, then we did uh, reflex action, then motivation and then instinct behavior. So with this we completed the first part then in the next video that is the third video we will be doing learned behavior or acquired behavior. So thank you all students if you have got any doubts you can get it clarified by typing on the chat box. Thank you all.